Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today on our um, NDSU Extension Agriculture Challenges webinar series. Today, we are going to have Ken Helving join us. He's going to be talking about harvest and drying of corn, so soybeans, and sunflowers. As we all know, there is uh, a lot of soybeans, about 50% according to our county agents across the state, um, are still left to be harvested in many counties and the majority of our corn and sunflowers are not harvested at this time. So I just have a couple housekeeping items before I turn it over to Frank, or Frank, sorry, excuse me, Ken. If you are not speaking, please mute your line. Um, we're gonna be holding all questions until the end of the, the webinar. Um, if you have a question and you're, you're gonna forget it, type it in the chat box and we'll make sure it gets addressed either way. And these will all be recorded and posted on the NDSU Extension Livestock Management um, webpage. And I will show you where to find that at the end of our webinar. With that, I will turn it over to Ken Halvey. He is our Extension Agriculture Engineer. Well, good afternoon. Uh, what I'm gonna try to do is run through uh, a number of slides very quickly. Uh, most of these are targeted to questions that I've been receiving and uh, as Miranda said we'll open it to questions at the end. I uh, thought I'd just start out with just a little reminder of, of the, what Miranda just already shared. Uh, as of November 3rd according to the crop report only 10 percent of our corn was harvested, roughly half of the soybeans and uh, about a quarter of the sunflowers. So there's a lot of our uh, row crops still out there waiting to be harvested. What they are harvesting is very high in moisture. Uh, getting reports, uh, just talked to someone with corn that's in, he said it's finally dried to about 27% moisture. So uh, again, even for those that are familiar with working with these wet grains, uh, this is the high end. When we look at at least the short-term forecast, I've shown the uh, NOAA maps up here. Uh, the one here in the bottom corner is a temperature for the 6 to 10 day forecast, which is November 11 through 15, showing us much below normal. Uh, as we go to the 8 to 14 day forecast, uh, the, which is November 13 through 19. We're still cool, maybe not quite as frigid, but unfortunately we're starting to look at some moisture coming in as well. So uh, as late as it is, as wet as things are, uh, in general, uh, I think people are deciding that they need to go out and harvest uh, regardless of what the conditions are. I'm going to cover uh, some things that we'll probably hear more of on uh, Friday. Uh, one of the questions though that I'm getting is, is what is the dry down going to be occurring out in the field? And some of you have seen this table before that I've used. Uh, as we get into November, I think uh, typically about a point a week is the best that we can expect starting to talk to people that are thinking of leaving the corn over winter and wondering what moisture content it will be by next spring. Uh, what I did was to look at what we call the equilibrium moisture content based on uh, average conditions for these different months. And if we're looking at, at February into March, we're still gonna be looking at roughly 20% moisture uh, in the spring. So if we're at 27, 26% moisture, some drying would occur over winter uh, very, very slowly. We can see over here on the right, uh, maybe two to three points over the whole month. So we're still gonna be looking at wet grain in, in the spring. The other part though that I think people need to keep in mind uh, if they're making that decision is that not only will we still have wet corn, but what are the potential field losses? And, and it can be anywhere from almost none to almost total loss. 
Uh, it's critical that we be checking the strength of the stock. This bottom left picture shows some corn that's not standing very well. And then also checking how well the, the cob is attached to the stock. Uh, those are, are going to really depend, indicate or depict what our condition is as we go through the winter. Also, we need to keep in mind that our average snowfall for the winter is about 40 inches. Uh, that's about four inches of water uh, that'll likely be sitting out in the field. The bottom right picture is a picture of the last time we went through something like this in 2009. Uh, and uh, there was a lot of snow accumulated, particularly around the edges of the field. What is that going to mean come spring? Uh, we're likely going to see wet soil conditions, uh, and we'll be hearing more on Friday as to what that means as far as, as getting in there to harvest and also what it might mean as far as, as preventing us from getting timely work done next spring. As we look at trying to deal with this high moisture corn, uh, we did some work back in 2009 looking at addressing the question, will that corn flow? And what we found was that that high moisture corn has enough surface moisture that the kernels will actually freeze together. Now, if we harvested at 20 degrees, it stayed at 20 degrees and it was removed from the bin again at 20 degrees. So it never went through any kind of uh, thawing. Uh, it did seem to flow, but anytime that uh, there was warmth involved, uh, everything froze into a block. 24 to 25% seemed to be some binding uh, and so really encouraged us to think of under 24% moisture uh, to allow that corn in the bin uh, to flow. The amount of foreign material also has an impact on that. Haven't heard a lot of questions yet about uh, bagging this wet corn, uh, but just some numbers to keep in mind. In that 25 to 35 percent moisture, we may go through an ensiling process. Uh, again, back in 2009, we had uh, a number of guys that harvested corn at temperatures near or below freezing, put it into the bag, and they were successful at storing it. The concern was that there was a little bit of an odor uh, in that corn as it was unloaded. Not severe, uh, but indicated that there was a little ensiling taking place. The 15 to 24 percent moisture I think will store fine as long as we're under 30 degrees. If we get above 30 degrees, that's going to be heating and spoiling on us and not uh, something that we want to occur. Anything that's going to be in the bag, uh, stored into the warmer temperatures of spring, summer, uh, really needs to be down at 13% or lower. If we are using bags, uh, we got to keep in mind that the sealed bag does not prevent mold growth or insect infestation. We should run the bags north and south so that we get even solar heat gain on the two sides. Otherwise, that tends to create a, a moisture accumulation on the north side of the bag. Select an elevated location with excellent drainage. Monitor regularly and then to use it uh, in the winter, preferably. Monitoring becomes ultimately important. Uh, Last year, a lot of reports of, of people that had grain in bags ended up with some tears in it and, and then uh, the associated problems that come with that. So uh, we do need to be monitoring the condition and hopefully uh, taking, keeping this more as, as a temporary storage. If we're dealing with 25 to 30% moisture, uh, in an environment where we don't want to put it in the bin, 
I would recommend putting it into some kind of uh, covered pile so that we can mechanically unload it. 28% uh, moisture corn, even at 40 degrees, only has an allowable storage time of 30 days. So uh, as long as it's, it's frozen and we can keep it cold under 30 degrees, we'll be okay, I think. But uh, anything where the temperatures start warming up is going to be a problem. So this very high moisture corn really needs to run through a high temperature dryer by early February. If we're in the low 20s, low to mid 20s, that 22 to 24 percent moisture, again, cool it to below uh, 20 degrees and then run it through a high temperature dryer uh, by early March. And this is part of the issue is that the solar heat gain can be pretty substantial. I've got listed here the, the average maximum temperatures. And as we get into March, we're starting to see temperatures above freezing. And when we start looking at, at end of February and into March, there's a lot of solar heat gain that occurs on the south side of that bin and on the top of the bin. So it's critical that we be running the aeration fans periodically, doing whatever we can to keep it under 30 degrees until uh, we have that dry. Another uh, concern of, of running fans at temperatures near or below freezing is that these vents can, can ice over. And when they do so, uh, the fan has enough pressure or force that it'll either pop the bin roof up or down, depending on which direction we're, we're moving the air. So I recommend that we leave the fill hole, the access door open as a pressure relief valve anytime we're running the fans at temperatures near or below freezing. Checking the moisture content uh, can be a challenge uh, under these cold conditions. Uh, the meters are typically calibrated for 15% moisture corn. Anytime we get in the 25 plus moisture range, likely that meter is going to have some error in the reading. The other thing is that most of the meters that are being used on the farm are not accurate at temperatures below 40 degrees. We need to verify that the unit uh, is making compensation for the uh, temperature that we're working with and uh, make sure that we're operating within the, the range. Some of the meters out there will give you a reading, but it'll be an error by several percentage points. The meters are also tending to be more accurate on the outside portion of the kernel rather than the, the moisture content throughout that kernel. So if we're either looking at uh, corn that has come through a dryer or any scenario where there might be condensation on the surface, that will cause an error in the reading. So I really recommend that we collect the sample, put it into a sealed container for six to 12 hours, have it at room temperature, and then recheck that moisture content. I'm starting to get qu quite a few calls related to test weight. And uh, of course, test weight varies with moisture content, uh, but it also can, the change in test weight is affected by the kernel damage, uh, drying temperature, and even corn variety. The more mechanical damage that occurs, the less increase in test weight that we'll see as that corn is, is dried down. Uh, and unfortunately, when we're dealing with higher moisture corn, we tend to see more mechanical damage out in the field uh, during harvest. Uh, and the more we get under high moisture conditions, we tend to push the dryer a little bit more, maybe run the dryer temperature a little bit higher, and that too will have an impact. Normally, I use a rule of thumb of about a quarter of a pound increase for every point of moisture being removed. Uh, but because of the, the challenging conditions this year, 
that rule of thumb may not apply. If a person's trying to, to make an estimate of what their drying cost will be and, and compare that to what uh, cost or expected losses might be leaving the corn stand out in the field, uh, typically we over the years have used this top formula uh, where you take the propane price uh, and you can calculate then roughly how much the, the propane or energy cost will be per point of moisture removed. Uh, that's assuming 2500 BTUs of energy required to take out a pound of water. In general I think that still applies uh, some of the more energy efficient dryers probably are down in this 2000 BTU range. So I kind of use the 0.02 times whatever the propane price is as an estimate. So if we were looking at $1 per gallon propane, uh, that would be two cents per bushel per point. So if we're taking corn from 25 to 15, taking off those 10 points of moisture, the propane or energy price would be about 20 cents a bushel. That does not include any of the capital costs, labor, or any of those things, but strictly the, the amount of propane that we're burning. We can also estimate the quantity of propane uh, by taking 0.02 again, times the number of bushels times the points of moisture. So if we're taking off again 10 points, and we had a thousand bushels, we take and multiply them together and we would expect that it would take about 200 gallons of propane to uh, take off those 10 points. And I should maybe just comment that, that most of these are up on the website already uh, under uh, the presentations for corn uh, and it's under high moisture corn uh, drying and storage. Uh, but as uh, Miranda indicated, this one will be posted shortly as well. When we look at, at high temperature drying uh, corn, uh, one of the things to keep in mind is that high temperatures, fast drying, fast cooling creates stress cracks, broken kernels, and a lower final test weight. And so, where in many years they might expect an increase in test weight if they're, I say, abusing the system a little bit, they may see a very minimal increase in test weight. High moisture conditions frequently also uh, result in scorching, partly because if we have immature kernels, the sugars will, will caramelize uh, and change color. Uh, I think the majority of our corn actually did get very close to mature uh, and so, so far I have not heard of that being an issue. Uh, but certainly on some of the immature corn, uh, it could be an issue. The only solution is to try to reduce the, the plenum temperature. Another reason for not delaying uh, drying is that uh, not only are we not seeing any drying or very little drying taking place out in the field, but the colder it is outside, the more heat it takes to, to heat that air and the corn, and we end up with seeing the drying cost increase. So uh, even though we're cold, we're looking at maybe 10 to 20 degree temperatures, that's better than, than temperatures below zero. Uh, that might occur a little bit later. We've got quite a few farmers that have relied on, on natural air or just air drying. Uh, the thing to keep in mind with that is that 21% moisture is, is the maximum moisture that we can handle. Uh, we need at least an airflow rate of one CFM per bushel. Uh, once temperatures start getting below 40 degrees, uh, the amount of, of moisture that that air is picking up is very limited. So at this time of the year, I think we're probably better off cooling the corn to 
below freezing, something in that neighborhood of 20 degrees, holding it over winter, and then doing the drying in the spring. There's a lot of numbers on this table, and a person can look at that uh, at your leisure, but the the real story is that, that even when we're adding supplemental heat in November, because of the cold air, the drying times are just too long. They're excessive. We're not, uh, it's extremely expensive drying and, and very slow drying. Uh, we could run the fan and the heater the whole month of, of uh, November, and at best, we're only getting about half of that been dry. And we could continue into December and it gets even worse. So when we get to these temperatures that are near freezing, we're better off looking either at high temperature drying or ho just holding the corn in some other manner uh, rather than trying to air dry. The natural air low temp drying will work well in the spring. Uh, again, 21% moisture is the maximum that we can handle. Uh, I've already had some calls where guys are, are doing partial drying. They might be starting at 27, 28% moisture, drying it to 20% and then putting it in the bin. Uh, that greatly increases the drying capacity that they have. It allows them to hold that corn and then they can either decide to do air drying in the spring or uh, run it through the high temperature dryer a second time. Anytime that we have uh, any damage to the kernel, the storability of that corn is uh, impacted. Uh, any immature corn cracked, broken, is going to have a much sto shorter storage life. Uh, and so that will need to be kept in mind as, as we're managing this grain, particularly as we go into spring and summer conditions. I'm gonna shift gears now and make a few comments on soybeans. Um, we are harvesting a lot of soybeans. Most of those soybeans though are still at moisture contents that are gonna require some type of drying. Uh, natural air low temperature doesn't work well, uh, any better on soybeans than it does on corn. So we're looking at running it through a high temperature dryer. Uh, typically, we're looking at a drier temperature of about 130 degrees uh, as the maximum temperature. And even there, uh, I encourage people to monitor uh, the condition of the soybeans coming out and adjust the temperature based on the amount of, of splits and, and cracked beans that might be showing up. Unfortunately, with soybeans, uh, there's a significant fire hazard associated with drying them. Uh, we tend to see more pods and trash in, in the soybeans. Uh, they become lodged or held up in the dryer, become overdried and combustible. Uh, and that's typically where we'll see fires start in a high temperature dryer. So it's critical that they be keeping the grain flowing, keeping the, the dryer clean, monitoring that dryer continuously uh, to make sure that that grain is flowing through. Uh, many of the manufacturers recommend completely emptying the dryer, doing a thorough cleaning at least once a day, uh, and that'll depend on the condition of the soybeans. Now let's shift to sunflowers. Uh, sunflowers have the same fire risk. Uh, and one of the things that, that is important to keep in mind is that the fire risk is not related to the drying temperature. Again, it, it's material within the, the sunflower that gets held up in the dryer, uh, where we end up with portions becoming overdried and combustible. And uh, also we have lint uh, that comes off of the sunflower seeds that can accumulate on the dryer. So again, if we need to be there constantly monitoring a dryer when we're drying sunflower, make sure that the sunflower is flowing through the dryer. If a fire starts, uh, shut the fan off, 
have fire extinguishers there. Uh, typically, if, if you're there monitoring just by using the fire extinguisher on the, the point that is, is on fire, you can extinguish it. And then we need to empty the dryer. Uh, used to be a, a huge issue uh, as the number amount of acreage that we have in sunflower decreased. We didn't hear of it as much. But this year with the very wet sunflower, uh, this is definitely a hazard for everyone to keep in mind. We do have a little more potential for air drying of the sunflower. Uh, in my old natural air low temperature crop drying publication, uh, I've calculated out airflow rates and moisture contents and how long it's going to take to dry. Uh, that table is based on October conditions. Roughly, as we shift from an average of about 50 degrees in October to 30 degrees in November, uh, drying times are roughly doubled. Uh, and so we Rather than looking at uh, maybe 27 or 20 days, we're looking at 40 or 50 days. Uh, and so typically we're not going to be able to completely dry sunflower uh, air drying. We'll have to hold it over winter and dry in the spring. Um, the table goes up to 17% and I'll show the next table as well at 17%. Uh, that requires at least an airflow of one CFM per bushel and over the years I've feeling more comfortable at 15 percent than at 17 percent. If we look at at November conditions um, you know as I indicated by adding some supplemental heat uh, we can make some progress but it'll depend on uh, what outside conditions are and we do need to add supplemental heat otherwise we're looking at 50 days and, and we just don't have that amount of days in November. Spring drying works excellent again for for sunflower uh, and with adequate airflow one CFM per bushel we can do the drying in roughly a month of fan time. There's going to be uh, maybe some temptation to pile the grain, uh, corn uh, in particular, uh, because it's high moisture. A uh, couple of things. One is it's critical that we have air going through that pile, but I usually uh, discourage it right off the, the, at the beginning because a one inch rain will increase the moisture content if we were to confine it to the top foot uh, by about nine percentage points. So we can go from uh, reasonable moisture contents to horribly wet conditions uh, with very, very little rain or snow that ends up getting mixed into the grain. Uh, this is a pile and you, if you take a look, you can see we've got two, in some places, almost three feet uh, of spoilage on the top. Elevators may be able to tolerate that. Farmers really shouldn't think about it. In order to have success with a pile, we need a prepared surface. We need a cover on it. We need a suction fan system to hold the cover. Uh, and then we need to make sure that there's aeration through that pile. If we design these as storage systems, they work, but I've seen way too many piles turn to mush uh, because we don't follow these practices. So extremely fast running through a, a number of points. Uh, I think I got it done in my 30 minutes, as I indicated earlier. Uh, you can do an internet search for NDSU grain drying and storage, brings you into my information. Uh, a lot of this information is already up on the website. So, time for questions. And we do have one question in the chat box, um, and it is, is 17% the max on sunflower? 
Yeah, and even 17, like I said, I'm nervous about because uh, I've had too many reports over the years from guys that had 17% moisture sitting in the truck overnight, and by morning it was hot. Uh, at 17%, there's a lot of respiration heat uh, that can be produced. Uh, and so by the tables, if you look at allowable storage times under these cool temperatures, we can uh, handle 17, but I really feel much more comfortable at 15. I, I think 17 and up is gonna have to go through a high temperature dryer. Do we have any other questions for Ken? It looks like I answered all the questions, so I won't need to answer any more on my phone. So, um, I'm sharing my screen right now. I just want to remind you that that the webinars are being recorded. If you go to the NDSU Extension page, um, the Livestock Management tab, and then down at the bottom, we have a topic page for, that links to where all these webinars are being posted. Um, tomorrow, or not tomorrow, we do not have a webinar tomorrow. Friday, um, we do have a webinar that will be on considerations for corn that is left unharvested in the field. Um, we will have Joel Ransom, um, Brian Parman, and Ken will be joining us again for that webinar. And we also have one scheduled for next week, Tuesday, um, that is going to be focused on swath grazing as an option for some of those crops, especially forage crops such as sorghum sedans that were crushed by snow and are going to be difficult, if not impossible, to bale. Um, and then we're looking at scheduling one on weaning. So I will make sure to keep everyone updated on those as we get those scheduled. And you have, if you have any questions, contact myself, contact your county extension agent, and we will, be a, we will try to direct you in the right direction. With that, I want to thank Ken again for joining us today, and we look forward to having him and all of you join us on Friday. Thank you. Have a good day, everybody.